Well, we've been talking about legacy, and I need to let you know so that your heart is being prepared. We've been talking about legacy now for a number of weeks, and I've been talking about what that means and the fact that you can receive a legacy. You can, your name can be on the contract. It can be in the will. It can be in the co covenant, and you can decide. You can say, you know what? <laughs> I don't want any part of that, and walk away from it, you can receive a great legacy, a great uh, blessing, and say, not interested, thanks, though. You can walk away from it. And I've been challenging us to, first of all, know what our legacy is, understand, you know, when they, when they begin to read a will, when they begin to talk about a covenant, the first thing they do is they sit everybody down and they say, let me read this to you. Let me explain to you what this covenant is all about. Let me tell you about it. Are there any questions? And so there's this understanding that kind of lays the groundwork that forms the, the decisions that are about to be made. And uh, so for the last few weeks, I've been talking about that in those kind of terms. This is what the legacy is, the legacy that Jesus has left us. And uh, we are the inheritors when we accept Christ as our Savior. And so salvation becomes our legacy and, and we enter into this covenant with him who has paid our sins. And because of that relationship, uh, I am no longer a debtor. I am, as Stephen said, I am the child of a king. He changed me from debtor's prison <laughs> to a palace and a mansion he's preparing in heaven. And then we talked a whole lot about four weeks, five weeks on the Holy Spirit because I don't think we talk enough about who the Holy Spirit is and what he does in our life. And so we spent a great deal of time talking about how he empowers us and how he gives us that uh, ability. He brings gifts. He brings the awareness. He teaches us. He sometimes confronts us. And then the last couple of weeks, we talked about the fruit of the Spirit and that that indeed is the real evidence of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. You, you can, you know, dance on the pews or jump over one of them or run up and down the aisle. I want to see the fruit of this. I, I want to see that too, but I want to see the fruit of the Spirit because that is the evidence that the Holy Spirit is at work. Well... Today, we kind of come to the end of this legacy series as we're wrapping up uh, the month of July. We've got one more Sunday, but as we begin to wrap it up today, I want to um, close this series out talking a little bit about so what now. You've heard about the legacy. You know the le Now, here it is. Here's how to enact it. Here's how to grab hold of it. And I want to give you an understanding. I have felt so prompted for the last few days that the most important thing that should happen here today is a season of prayer in our church. A time when we just kind of slow this ship down and we pause and we spend a little bit of time. There are several folks that have asked to be anointed today it just god is at work doing something and i think we want to be part of that it's part of our legacy so expect the sermon to be a little bit abbreviated but expect our prayer time at the close to be a moment where the people of god the sons and daughters of god just sit around the communion table called the altar we make this place, this whole place, an altar. If you're watching online today, I want you to be prepared. When I'm done preaching, don't shut this off. I want you to know that the close is not the end of the sermon. I want you to be aware today that our closing is really the time we're going to spend with the Father. 
So in the legacy series and what I want to present to you today, it's a sermon, it's a message, it's a legacy that's been passed from generation to generation to generation. And today we pick up the words of Peter and every so often I point you to first and second Peter. Today I want to point you to first Peter. And I want you to hear the words of this disciple of Christ who is the apostle. Once Jesus uh, has ascended to heaven, he becomes an apostle. He literally becomes kind of a, a leader in the church. He becomes the rock that Jesus had prophesied he would become. Uh, you were Simon, which meant pebble. Now I'm going to call you Petra which means rock. And so Peter becomes literally this foundation stone in the church that Jesus is building. And in so doing, he begins to minister to churches all across Asia and Asia Minor. And he begins to speak to them and address them. At the point in which we're going to read today in 1 Peter, the church is literally there in Asia, Asia Minor. The church that he's writing to is literally under serious attack. We feel like we're under attack, don't we? I mean, in this country, I don't know about you, and I'm not, I refuse to get into politics, but I just have to tell you there are lots of days I read the newspaper and wonder, what country is that they're talking about? Because that's not the country I know. So I wonder about that. I feel under attack. I feel as though uh, the nation I live in is under attack. I feel as though the values and the traditions that we have held as the Christian body of Christ, I believe they're under attack. I think the word of God is under attack. I think we're living under attack and there may not be anybody holding a gun at my head when I go out the door today. I, I may not be threatened by my life, but I'm here to tell you my life, ah, it's a few years and gone. My soul though, eternity, it's under attack and we the sons and daughters of God, the recipients of the legacy, must therefore understand. That's what Peter is saying to the church when he's writing First and Second Peter. They were under attack. And I'm not just talking about politically. I'm not just talking about economically. I'm not just talking about values. Their very lives were under attack. And they were suffering greatly. And Peter writes to them about this legacy, and he begins to say to them, the, the very things I've been saying to you for the last six weeks, do you know who Jesus Christ is? Friends, I'm going to ask you one more time today, do you know who Jesus Christ is? He is the Son of God. He's born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He died on a cross called Calvary for my sins, for your sins. Do you know who Jesus is? I mean, do you really know who he is or do you just know about him? Do you know that he loved you? Do you know that he brings healing? Do you know he brings hope? Peter is writing to them and in 1 Peter chapter 1, he's literally saying, do you know who Jesus is? And do you know what he's done? And do you know that a living hope that he brings to you? And then he goes on and he begins to talk about, and do you know who the Holy Spirit is? He's literally telling these people in 1 Peter, He's literally saying to them, do you understand the legacy? He's saying to them, do you understand you're like the first generation of the legacy? Now, we're way down the line, but the legacy hasn't changed. And so Peter begins to write to them, and he says, do you really know Jesus? Do you really know who the Holy Spirit is? Do you know that when the Holy Spirit comes, he doesn't just come to keep you company while you go on living like the world? 
He doesn't just come to make you feel good in your sin. The Holy Spirit comes. And I sometimes wonder if the church knows this, understands this. And I don't mean this church only. I mean the church. Peter literally writes to them and he says, Do you know that when the Holy Spirit comes, he comes to cleanse us. He comes to set us apart. He comes to bring holiness into our life. The choices we make, the words we use, what we think about, where we go, what we do, the attitudes we carry, the actions, the way we treat one another. Do you know who the Holy Spirit is? That's what Peter's saying to them. And they're saying, well, well, wait a minute, I'm under persecution. Do I have to think about that? And Peter's saying, your lives, your lives, they're a blink. They're a moment in time. But your soul is for eternity. And so Peter writes to them and he says, don't forget who you are. Know who Jesus is. Know who the Holy Spirit is. Know what happens when you join the covenant, when you, when you make the covenant, when you, you give your life to him. Know, know who you are. And so he writes these words in second, or in 1 Peter chapter 2. And I want to read them to you today, actually out of two different um, passi- or out of two different versions. So hear the word of the Lord today for the people of God and hear what the legacy is and understand who you are. Know your identity. 1 Peter chapter 2, and I want to begin reading in verse 9. The scripture says this. Now remember, these are people dying for their faith. These are people who are being persecuted. These are people who are paying the price not like I am, that, you know, spending a few extra hours, getting up early, going to bed early, you know, doing a little extra here and there, paying a little... Less. These are people who are paying everything to serve Christ. Here's what he says to them. But you, you, you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. I doubt they felt very much like any of these. (laughs) I'm just saying, when you've got somebody threatening your life the next day, um, this doesn't feel like who I am. And then he says this, you are God's special possession. Why? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. And then I want you to hear this uh, out of uh, the message, the, the next couple of verses. Hear this out of the message. He says to them, Friends, this world is not your home. So don't make yourself cozy. <laughs> don't indulge, listen to this one, don't indulge your ego at the expense of your soul, but rather live an exemplary life in your neighborhoods so that your actions will refute their prejudices against you. Then they will be won over to God's side, and there they will join you in great celebration when he returns. I love that. I don't often read out of the message, but I like that one. Don't get cozy. This ends your home. <laughs> no, don't take your shoes off. We're, we've got a place to go. We've got something to do. Well, I just want to share with you two things today, and I'm as serious as I can be about spending time in prayer then. So here are the two things I want to say to you. First of all, Peter writes to them and he says, your legacy, you need to understand your legacy. Sometimes, friends, we become more informed 
about who we are by the world around us. We become more informed about the voices we hear in our head. We become more informed about what is being told to us. We become more informed by our fears than by the truth of the legacy. So Peter says to them, here's who you really are. You are chosen. You are chosen. You, you were invited. You were asked. I loved it when Stephen said to us this morning, before God ever sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross, he already knew your name. He already knew who you were. He already understood that you would be formed in your mother's womb. He already loved you. You were chosen. And, and before we get to feeling really special and, and uh, a little spoiled, that's true of every person. So the next time you cross paths with someone who doesn't treat you quite the way you think they should, or the next time you walk around and you bump into somebody you don't particularly care for, I want you to know and understand God loves them as much as he loves you. He loves them as much as he loves you. The prostitute on the street, the drug addict laying in the gutter, the, the people that we don't often think about, care about, the people in this neighborhood who do crazy things, God loves them every bit as much as he loves me. He loves them every bit as much as he loves my children and my grandchildren. If I understand who I am, if I really understand the legacy that is mine, then I want you to know and to understand the church has got to get this in the day we live in. Because I honestly think these are easy days compared to what's coming. That's my opinion. I think if we don't get ready, we're going to be sorry. And part of getting ready is understanding who we are. And so he begins to say you're chosen, not so we can bubble wrap you and make you feel good. Being chosen, and, and we've struggled over the last year. I mean, we've done amazing. Don't misunderstand me. This church has done amazing, but we've struggled a bit. We're still struggling. And we've had some folks who had said, well, they just can't get it together. I'm leaving. I, I'm just going on down the road. I want you to hear me say this today. And it's, it's not a, about anybody. It's to us. When you're chosen, you are not chosen so that you can be comfortable. You're not chosen so that you can be in a place where it makes you feel good. If God has set you in a place, if God has called you to a location, if God has said to you, this is where I am setting you, that's scriptural, by the way. The word of God says that he sets us in the body just as it pleases him, not you. So if he has set us in the body and that's our chosenness, then do you understand your chosenness is not so you feel good, it's so that his kingdom purposes are fulfilled. His kingdom purposes fulfilled. I'm chosen. Not so I can walk around and say, na 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 na, I'm chosen. I'm chosen so that I can labor in the field for all of those around me that God loves as much as he loves me. Yeah, that is a... I'm chosen. And, and, and walk with this a little bit because every disciple talks about this. I'm chosen so that I can suffer for the cause of Christ. Whatever that means. Whatever price I pay. Whoever doesn't like me, whoever doesn't think it's good, I'm chosen. Think about that being chosen. You've been chosen. Uh, it, it'll make you, you know, tremble in your shoes, right? Mary, the angel says to Mary, you are highly favored. God has chosen you. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, try, try Rachel. Try her. She, go choose her, right? That's not an easy deal. How about you? 
What has God chosen you for? What has he chosen? It, it's probably not comfortable, quite frankly. But it's for a kingdom purpose. What has he chosen you for? The second thing he says to them is you're a royal priesthood. I love that one. You are a royal priesthood. When he says that you are a royal priesthood, do you understand that I could spend all day just preaching about that one? Royal pri the royal priesthood he's talking about, you don't get to sign up for that. You don't take seminary classes to become that. You don't you know, join and, and do an internship. To be the royal priesthood, to be that, both by royalty and by priesthood, you had to be born into it. So when he's talking about this, he's saying you were born into a royal priesthood. You carry that as part of the legacy. And what do priests do? <laughs> priests become the individuals who um, carry people to God and who bring the word of God to people. Priests, if you think about this for a minute, priests were the ones who led others in praising God. We ought to be priests. He says we're royal priests. We ought to be people who are leading others in praising God. I'm going to ask you today, what are you leading people in doing? That'll rock your world a little bit. What are you leading people in doing? Are you leading people... <laughs> in getting sales at Walmart? Are you leading people in complaining? Are you leading people in finding fault? Are you leading people in confusion? Oh man, I deal with that a lot. People are confused about everything right now. I don't know if we should be doing... What are we leading people in? Because that's what a priest, a royal priest does. Here it is, it's pretty simple. I lead people to the throne of God. I want to tell you about my Savior. I want you to know this amazing God. I want you to get to know the Holy Spirit who wants to infill you and bless you and, and give you power to be his witnesses. We are royal priesthood. So the next time, <laughs> the next time you open your mouth, the next time you're part of a conversation, I want you to ask yourself the question, are these words of a royal priest? When I start to complain and whine, back it up, Jeanette. Is that the words of a royal priest? When I begin to find fault and point fingers, is that what a royal priest does? I don't think so. We point to the almighty God who loves us well let me hasten he says you're a holy nation you are a holy nation wow do you know that today and I don't know what you guys are going to do with this but do you know that today by and large all of the illnesses I'll call them illnesses sins whatever you call they are as rampant in church churches across the as they are outside. Why is that? Why is it that we have the same kind of infidelity, the same kind of divorce rate, the same kind of, of issue? Why is it that in the church we have the same, almost the same percentage as the world? I think it's because we don't know who we are. We have not understood. We are literally called to be a holy nation. <laughs> You're really quiet. I know what that means, Chuck. <laughs> we are called to be a holy nation. That, that's like almost antithetical to where we live today because you see, we live in a culture that wants you to accept everything. All things, all thi you know, if he's a God of love, then he wouldn't have any trouble with this or that. Or the, um, We're a holy nation. And while I will honor the laws of this land, I will not participate in that which is unholy. Just get it clear. 
While I recognize that there is a court of law that I must answer to, I want you to understand I answer to a higher court. And I'm going to answer to that court first. And so, no, it's not okay. It's not okay to say, well, the loving thing. You know, we ought to be kind. We ought to be loving. We ought to be accepting. All those things are true, but you don't accept the sin along with the person. You don't bring the sin into the house. My love is to be the priest who brings God to you and you to God. My, my acceptance is to tell you I've got good news for you. My friends, I'm just saying, do we know who we are? Or have we learned to live more like the world? A holy nation, a royal priesthood, chosen. And then he goes on and he says, you're God's possessions. You are God's possessions. I want to close this up because I want us to go to prayer. When he moves on past that, he begins to tell us why. He says, here's why. It's so that the way you live, the things you say, the way you act, how you conduct yourself, it's so that your praises to God, not, not your songs, that w that's really nice when we're in here and we sing prayer. He's talking about 24-7 so that my praises to God, my life, my, the way I, I act, the way I live, the way I work, the way I, I in, um, interact with people. He's saying, you should be living in such a way that it is evident even to those who find fault with you, even to those who don't like you, even to those who are looking to get you. You ought to be living in such a way that the world around you goes, man, there must be something to this Jesus thing. There must be, because, I mean, here you go. Friends, I'm just saying, if we live like the world, if we hold grudges against each other or others, if we talk about one another the way the world does, if our mouths are filled with the same language as the world, if our lives are tangled up with the same things that entangle the world, how will they ever see our praises and know our God? It's your legacy. You can walk away. You can say, not for me, thanks. I'm good. I'm good. I, I just want to fly under the radar. I'm telling you this, you're missing your legacy. So today, we're just going to turn this place into a house of prayer. And I'm going to invite us, I am going to invite us to use these altars. Um, I know you pray, but sometimes we pray really safely. Can I just say that? We pray really comfortably. I want to tell you what we're praying about today, and we're going to be anointing some folks. Revive Ohio, you heard, Revive Ohio. My friends, there are hundreds of people coming to Springfield to talk about Jesus Christ to the Springfield community. Could we pray about that this morning? And I'm going to ask um, Stephen and Rebecca Roten, who are the chair people for our missions committee, would you come forward? This is probably going to be pretty uncomfortable for everybody right now. Would you come forward? Doug Black, I saw you earlier. You have been our connector to Revive Ohio. Where are you, Doug? Would you come forward? There he comes. We're praying for Snyder Park. You guys, just take a place here at the alders. We're praying for Snyder Park. Do we have any teachers that are at Snyder Park? Do we have teachers in the Springfield District? Do we have anybody connected to our schools? And where's Dave Riley? Is Dave Riley in the house today? If Dave, there he comes. Dave is our Kids Hope Director. He is making direct contact with Snyder Park on our behalf. Friends, this isn't just, a, oh, isn't that nice? 
Dave's connecting with them. He'll take them bags of candy. This man, we're taking Jesus to them, all right? Educare. I don't see Nikki here today, but I saw Stephanie earlier and, and some others that are, there are, Greg, Greg is one of the members, board members to Educare. If you're part of Educare in any way, shape, or form, would you just come? We just want you to come and pray today. We're praying for our country. <laughs> and I'm going to ask this morning, if you are a veteran, would you just come and pray for our country? Would you come and kneel and ask God? If you're a military person or a veteran, if you're in the military, you've been in the mil, I'm going to ask you to come and pray. doesn't mean it's not my country, but I am going to ask our veterans to come now. <laughs> right now. <laughs> Thank you. you. Sometimes you just have to apply a little pressure. <laughs> If you're a member of our search committee, if you are on our search committee, uh, Steve, I see you sitting there. I don't know where. Lisa, I saw Lisa a little bit ago. There are members of our search committee that are here today. Would you just come and be at these altars? And I don't care if you stand or you kneel or you lay down on the floor. I don't care. I'm here to tell you, friends, you better get serious about praying for your pastor that's coming. I don't know when. I don't know when. I thought they would come <laughs> months ago, right? I don't know when. Here's what I do know. It's not because there's reluctance on your search committee's part. Not at all. It's not because they haven't been doing due diligence. I don't know why God is waiting. But you better be praying. Because I'm telling you this church is in the balance. So if you love Maiden Lane, you better be praying. Lorna Koffenberger, she's been in the hospital for quite a while. She's finally home. If there's anybody here that knows Lorna, would you just come and find your place at the altar? We're gonna anoint some folks here in just a moment. If you know Lorna, you're praying for Lorna, would you just come do that for us? Skip. Skip Mitterholzer is here today and his family. Skip has received some news that isn't the best news, at least not for his journey here on earth. But he knows his legacy, knows all about his legacy. He's claiming the legacy. But we're asking Skip, he's asked, can I come and be anointed? Can I have God anoint me? So we're going to ask the family, just, we got a whole altar over here for the Mitterholzers. Would you just come be a part of that? The Fanslers had some pretty bad news this morning about uh, a grandnephew of theirs that's being life flighted to Cincinnati. If you're on the Board of Elders, if you know Joe and Bonnie, you're connected to them, would you just come? Would you just be a part of praying for them? They are right now, this minute, transporting family members to Cincinnati, going to be with this grandnephew that they don't know if he'll live or die, 34 years old. We have a fellow pastor in the area. I know many of you have heard about it. His name is Greg Nerger. His wife, 29-year-old wife, he's a pastor at Fellowship. His 29-year-old wife passed away this week, leaving a 3-year-old and a 7-year-old and a grieving husband. If you care about Fellowship, I know, Julie, you've got some family over there. If you care about fellowship, about what's happening there, would you just come and pray for them today? Would you pray for the fellowship church? Would you pray for Greg and his family and what's ahead of them? Faith. Faith Pencil has surgery coming up, and she's got some, some information that she's not overly comfortable with about that. And she's going to come today. Faith, I'm going to ask you to just sit on the front row right here. We've got space on the front row. We're going to ask you to come and sit. 
We're going to anoint Faith. If you'd like to put your hands on Faith, if you'd like to stand around her, if you're in her Sunday school class, if she has ministered to you through her music, if you have been blessed by her life, would you just come put your hands on Faith? We're going to anoint her and pray for her. You've heard all of these. So many prayer concerns, so many needs that are here. If you're still in your pew and you want to be part of this prayer, get up and come on. Don't wait for me to invite you. The invitation has been made and it's called Calvary. If you want to be part of laying hands on any of these people, if, if you're saying, I don't know about that, I'm going to ask you to do this. If you're able, would you make your pew where you are? Would you make it an altar? Some of you are healthy enough. Get down there on your knees and let's spend some prayer time. <laughs> I know it's a little old-fashioned. I get it. It's like, what in the world has the woman lost her mind? I don't know, maybe. But if I've lost my mind, I want to find Jesus in the midst of it. So friends, I invite you right now. Would you make where you are an altar? These people are here. Would you pray? Stephen is going to lead us in some worship, and I'm going to ask you guys to be praying. I'm going to come by and anoint some of you. Would you be praying and worshiping for these things that we've talked about, and then I'll come back and close in just a moment.